Hi everyone, welcome back to ThursDev. My name is Luke, and today I'd like to start talking a little bit about video game financial models and revenue streams. There's a lot of talk about design, programming, art technique, and many other things on the internet, but especially when it comes to indie game development, I've found that there seems to be a sad dearth of solid information and advice about how professional studios actually design their revenue streams. Of course, emulating existing business models is always a valid technique, but like it or not, in a for-profit game development business, the profit model is an inextricable part of the process that should always be kept in mind and should inform the design process in many ways. If you're going to be making a premium game with DLC, you need to design a game that will be profitable both with and without that DLC, but you also have to design it so that the DLC will fit into your game. If you're going to create a free-to-play game, even more importantly, you're going to have to be intimately familiar with the tools that those who have come before you have used to stay afloat. So this new ThursDev segment, Business Models, will explore various business models that are employed in games, how they inform those games' design, and their pros and cons. To get our feet wet, though, I'm going to start with something a little antiquated. If you want to talk about business models in video games, there's no better place to start our history lesson than the video arcade. Today I'm going to talk about arcade games, their mechanics, and their financial model, and how they inform game design in the present. I was a kid in the 1980s. A number of our younger viewers may not have any overly strong memories of the video arcade since they really started to go out of fashion even as long ago as when I was in high school. But I grew up with them and at one point they were even a ubiquitous part of the scenery in public places. Though I'm personally not of an age where I remember the so-called golden age between the late 70s and early to mid 80s, they were still everywhere when I was young. Not necessarily on every street corner, but certainly in any mall, airport, pizzeria, or comic shop that you might care to poke your head into. As children, it was a great opportunity for parents to get us out of their hair by handing over five bucks to keep us busy for an hour or so while even just maybe developing some social skills through healthy competition and next up quarters on the edge of the screen. Ultimately, in my own childhood, the frequency of trips to the arcade were few and far enough between that I don't think I managed to make a large enough dent in my parents' finances to be overly destructive, but it was one of my first true experiences in spending a lot more money than maybe I should have on video games. As an adult, especially as one who deals with the prices of things like DLC on otherwise free games, it's very interesting to reflect on arcade games as they pioneered genres and profoundly influenced game mechanics design during their heyday, even into the present. As likely anyone can tell you, arcade games were designed to be money-eating machines. In order to play, in some cases as few as a single life in a game, the player would have to feed a 25 cent coin into the arcade machine. This would generally speaking net you somewhere in the range of 3 to 5 minutes of gameplay, depending on what you were playing, and how much skill you had as a player, with some exceptions to the rule. In games like Pinball, where the game is limited by the laws of physics and perhaps the width of the drain space between flippers, the player is afforded a large amount of control over the board. Even a novice can quickly learn some of the more useful tricks like hold trapping and slap saves, greatly increasing their playtime. But in a game whose entire revenue stream is predicated upon fast play session turnaround, this slows the inflow of cash and the value of the machine is reduced. If the game isn't leased and instead is owned by whoever happens to run the arcade, then they're on the hook to break even on the device's cost. Not to say that they didn't necessarily bring in any other value to the venues that they were present in, but still eventually a business owner is going to want a tertiary piece of hardware to pay for itself. As games go though, pinball is pretty timeless. People still play and enjoy old machines to this day. But like the video game market, digital games have a short lifespan. People will still play Donkey Kong or Burger Time if they find a cabinet for nostalgia value, but the vast majority of arcade game popularity only lasted maybe a year or two before they were edged out by another, newer, shinier game. If you were still offering Street Fighter 2 and there was a Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Edition cabinet available across the hall, you went across the hall. 
Some, like House of the Dead or Puzzle Bobble, managed to be just unique enough to get a stranglehold on the market, and Neo Geo cabinets worked well enough to keep Goss down by offering multiple games to a single cabinet, but ultimately, a game had to be popular and damned hard in order to be profitable. Early games were already fairly challenging from the get-go. The average arcade game would have a handful of levels with minor differences, but difficulty would quickly ramp up through the introduction of more negative feedback until the average player would eventually hit a wall and lose the game, needing to feed another quarter into the machine in order to continue to play. Even though progression was fairly simple in general, early arcade games were a surprisingly social form of media, and high scores were considered a powerful motivator. The fact that leaderboards are still a major component of online gaming into the present day tells me that this still holds true to a certain extent. The idle screen of most games cycled through the game logo, attract screens, and high scores in basically every case. And this sense of competition, even on single player games, was enough to wring a few extra quarters out of the competitive players, as feeding another quarter into the machine would allow the player to try again without losing all their points, so taking a break meant a permanent loss of progression and loss of any chance at those bragging rights. As arcade games evolved into more directed experiences, so too did the avenues wherein the game could offer hard pay points while still encouraging players to continue. The belt-scrolling beat-em-ups, Double Dragon, Final Fight, D&D Shadows Over Mystara, and so on were a surprisingly apt example of this design, and a real influencer of games that would follow in their footsteps. Like the popular Maze Runner Gauntlet, instead of instant death upon contact with an enemy, which was sort of the order of the day, the beat-em-up gave the player a life bar. Every punch, thrown knife, or blast from a lobbed stick of dynamite would lower the player's life, and eventually, if you did didn't manage to get your hands on some sweet, sweet barrel chicken, it would be game over. In these games you would be faced with wave upon wave of enemy quicker than you, able to avoid your attacks, and able to do a whole lot more damage than you had the ability to do yourself. In many cases, the game would even gleefully throw a nearly undodgeable attack in the form of a giant gout of fire from a dragon or a synchronized bomb toss. Very infrequently would these completely deplete your life in a single go, unless it was a boss fight, but they were enough to whittle away at your life bar and eventually kill you. Some games gave you a power attack that would clear out large groups of enemies, but damage you in the process. Everything in the game is designed to damage you, even your own best moves. The game wants to put you in a position where you're always doing well enough to progress. The enemies come in droves because you feel like you're doing better, beating more enemies and therefore doing well. But ultimately, eventually, something would get you, and it would get another quarter out of you. This was taken even further when the beat-em-up evolved into fighting games. By creating games where the player competes against another person or against an AI opponent in a ladder-style tournament, the stakes were raised even more. A fight was a game of skill against another opponent that was just as good as you, and you couldn't blame the game on being unfair if another person was able to beat you. And with these mechanics, the length of a single quarter's play also was reduced. Three minutes at the absolute maximum if two fights ended in a timeout draw. More likely, a single quarter would be eaten in maybe 30 seconds to a minute of play, and players, competitive as we naturally were, lined up to fight and be defeated constantly by the champion. Even the single player game could be interrupted by a second player inserting a quarter, as the single player game was really just a distraction from the main attraction, short single match fights where someone lost a quarter. This is how arcade games worked. Nearly every single arcade game was designed to be fast-paced, competitive, and to make that quarter last as short a time as possible while still offering enough entertainment value for you to want to feed another one into the machine. And it worked! It was only due to the introduction of easy access to arcade-style home video gaming with the Super Nintendo, Genesis, and TurboGrafx-16 catching up close enough to the graphical quality of the arcade that arcades really started to taper off. And by the mid-90s, when 64-bit consoles like the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation hit the market, and even further revolutionized home gaming with 3D-capable consoles, did they truly start to become the endangered species that they are today. Unfortunately, the arcade model was 
no longer attractive to consumers, especially of my age, as we had access to the same games at ultimately far lower prices. Thanks to the proliferation of premium games, eventually the pay-to-play for five minutes model was no longer an option. Some valiant holdouts still carry the torch. Nickel City lasted a long time, Dave & Buster's is still out there, but the day of the arcade has passed, and business models have moved onward. We moved into the age of premium gaming, and that lasted a long time. Still, arcade-style gaming itself persisted. The beat-em-up genres, fighters, and the concept of hard games with repeatable lives are tropes in many games, and arcade has become a well-loved genre. But the idea that you would pay a dollar to play a game for 20 minutes or less has become a little bit distasteful. Hell, we've even gotten to the point where the dollar for the game is starting to feel like too much for some, but that's a story for another episode. For now though, that's arcades. Quarter Eaters may be the realm of the hobbyist now, but the quest for a profit model that fits continues. Thank you for watching this week's Thursday. This series will continue next week. Until then, though, thank you as always for watching. If you'd like to keep up with our videos, of which we post one every day, do hit that subscribe button down below and YouTube will do the rest for you. Even if you don't, though, I'm always glad to have you drop by. For now, though, see you tomorrow and take care.